With ZocDoc, you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. Go to ZocDoc.com slash cult and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash cult. ZocDoc.com slash cult. Thank you to our sponsor, Skims. Skims fits everybody and more best-selling essentials are available now at skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75 all at skims.com. After you place your order, be sure to let them know that we sent you. Select podcast in the survey and be sure to select our show in the drop-down menu that follows. Don't choose between wearing great makeup and taking care of your skin. Right now, Kozas is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more when you go to kozas.com slash cult. Go to K-O-S-A-S dot com slash cult for 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more, plus free shipping. That's K-O-S-A-S dot com slash cult. The views expressed on this episode, as with all episodes of Sounds Like a Cult, are solely host opinions and quoted allegations. The content here should not be taken as indisputable facts. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. They tried to erase their connection to Russia, but at one point, Armin Hammer was the only person from the States that could land in Russia and China. And he would be somewhere else in Europe, hear that Lenin passed away, be on the runway, fire up the jet again, get approval to land in Russia. And he's getting a better seat than any U.S. president because they didn't want the U.S. presidents being shown on TV at that funeral. So there was stuff like that left, right and center. This family is cultier than we even thought. This is Sounds Like a Cult, a show about the modern-day cults we all follow. I'm Amanda Montel, author of the book Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism. I'm Issa Medina. I'm a stand-up comedian, and you can catch my tour dates on my Instagram. Every week on our show, we discuss a different zeitgeisty group that puts the cult in culture, from celebrity megachurches to theater kids, to try and answer the big question. This group sounds like a cult, but is it really? And if so, which cult category does it fall into? Live your life, watch your back, or get the fuck out? For our new listeners, a live your life level cult is like a baby cult. Definitely fanatical, but mostly harmless. A watch your back level cult is borderline dangerous, checks off some of the culty boxes, but isn't totally destructive. And then we have a get the fuck out level cult, which is like QAnon level Manson vibes, AKA run for your life. After all, what classifies a cult is up to interpretation. All right, here we go. Today we are talking about the cult of the Hammer family. So you might be familiar with this name because of Army Hammer, who's a well-known actor. Some of his work includes Call Me By Your Name and The Social Network. And a couple years ago in early 2020, there were viral headlines accusing Army Hammer of being a cannibal and sexually abusing women. But those allegations are just the tip of the iceberg. This seems like a story about a handsome actor who was accused of sexual abuse on past partners, but it is really a story about an entire family full of abuse and cult-like influence. Today we're structuring our episode a little bit differently. We've invited a third co-host of sorts to join us, Lauren Skay, who helped expose the story of the Hammer family in 2020 and 2021 on TikTok and was a key source in the Discovery Plus documentary House of Hammer, So Good, which uh, partially inspired this whole episode. Lauren knows this story inside and out and is going to help us tell it and then analyze the cultiest aspects of the Hammer family, which affect not only its members, but also the public at large. For some setup, we're going to be talking about four generations of Hammers in this episode, all in relation to the present day young actor, Army Hammer. So there's Army Hammer's father, Michael. There's Army Hammer's grandfather, Julian. And then there's the head, the patriarch of the family, the one who started it all, his great-grandfather, Armand Hammer, who of course Army was named after. This podcast examines how the word cult can mean so many different things and show up in so many different ways. And today's cult is fascinating because it isn't just about the Hammers themselves. It's a bigger discussion about how too much money and power and ego in this country can turn a seemingly aspirational family into something more like a cult. If you're a fan of the show Succession, parts of of this story are going to sound eerily familiar. This is a story involving branding, abuse, murder, money, politics. Oh, God. We're going to have Lauren summarize the background and then get into analyzing the cultiest qualities of the Hammer family. The tea is piping hot and it tastes like human flesh. 
Lauren, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Oh, hi, guys. My name is Lauren Skay. I'm also known on social media as Zen Blonde. You may know me from everything that went down with Army Hammer, which is why I guess the tea, it tastes like human flesh, which is just... <laughs> Such a, oh my God, such a visual, like almost like, ooh, ooh. Multi-sensory. Multi-sensory for sure. <laughs> You've already told us so many of these stories. That's why we wanted to like sit down with you in person to flesh it out. But you once <laughs> described it as like succession vibes. Flesh it out. I can't. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I know. Well, it's really like so multi-generational and it feels like it's, it's still ongoing. I mean, stuff is still happening. So it's crazy that nobody's uncovered this before and that we're just hearing about it now and it makes you wonder how many other hammer families there are out there but yeah i'm super excited to be here chatting with you all about it today we are just jazzed beyond reason to have you here to discuss this with us because i first became familiar with you and your work and your connection to the hammer family your exposure of them when i watched the hammer documentary on discovery plus i subscribed to discovery plus for a month just to watch best five dollars ever spent can you set up how you were involved with the documentary a little bit because it's a fantastic docu-series so it's called house of hammer on discovery plus you can subscribe for a month for five dollars um so how this all unfolded was obviously like i mean deep pandemic we were all seeing the crazy social media storm regarding the allegations that came out about army hammer and it's not just like you know there's obviously a lot of allegations regarding people in hollywood abusing their power and assaulting women and stuff like that but this was on a completely different level because there were these like cannibalistic texts that were just like driving it to a new level of fucked up that we were all just like, what the actual hell? And so it caught my attention, but I was also just like kind of like disturbed by it. And, you know, you go around L.A. and you see Hammer on a lot of different like flag posts because there's a Hammer Museum. So a friend of mine, Caitlin, was on Reddit and she knew I was doing a bunch of TikTok stuff. And she's like, hey, like, you know, on the Army Hammer Reddit thread, people are saying that his aunt has a book. And I found the book is called Surviving My Birthright by Casey Hammer. You can buy it on, I think, Amazon. Great book. And honestly, the documentary didn't get half the shit in it. How could it? There's so much. I was surprised it was only three parts. I was like, this could have been like a 10 part documentary. I know if the vow was two seasons, <laughs> yeah. like hours yeah. and hours of footage. But I do appreciate that about a true crime docuseries when it keeps it really tight because yeah. the intrigue remains. And the family runs so deep. And that's something that like shocked me about the documentary, which I, I love that when a documentary is so juicy, just when you think it can't get worse, it does. But let's start from the beginning. What I remember is that the reason it all started was kind of because of the rumors about Army Hammer specifically, right? And then you kind of looked into the research, started with him and slowly trickled down through the family. So what did you find out about Army Hammer? Is he a carnivore? <laughs> a carnivore? Wait, what is it? <laughs> a carnivore is you. <laughs> I'm a carnivore. Yeah, so I think these allegations of cannibalism <laughs> made for such sensational headlines. And it's kind of wild that those headlines really were just a scratch on the surface. These headlines were basically claiming that Army Hammer was exchanging text messages with various women that implied that he like wanted to eat their ribs. It was all just like very salacious. Can you sort of speak to how those allegations of cannibalism were really just the tip of the iceberg and how you started to dive under the surface and discover more? Yeah, absolutely. So just like all of you, I was horrified by the headlines. And I don't know if you remember Paige Lorenz, one of his alleged victims. So she's one of the women that came forward with accusations against Army right. Hammer specifically. Right. And she actually had a photo of an A that he carved into her pelvis. So, you know, obviously, like, who knows how much further Army would have gone if left unchecked. But obviously, these things started coming out. Then I found Casey's book, and I delved into Casey's book and then you realize like this is a multi-generational thing. Like not only was Army Hammer doing these things presently as a famous actor, but then it was alleged that Army's father had a sex throne and it was actually written up in a Vanity Fair article. Then Army's grandfather was known as the Hugh Hefner of Pacific Palisades and he had a whole throng of stories about him. And then before Army's grandfather, Army's great-grandfather Armand Hammer an industrialist, an oil tycoon who owned Occidental Petroleum, had his own crazy just list of 
things that you wouldn't believe. And for this to even be one person in a family to see, you know, all these generations of men having this behavior around them was just mind blowing. That is the detail. You know, once the family tree started to become exposed because, you know, one person abusing their power in a certain way can be culty, but when the tentacles reach so far and so deep, you start to realize like there are so many different layers to this cult that yeah. kind of touch the whole public. And the way that they all function as individuals is highly influenced by the way that their family is structured. Because they come from a wealthy family, there are a lot of power dynamics that affect for example, who got hold of the business, who got the money passed down to them, and like who was the favorite grandchild, which was Army Hammer. And so the thing that is so powerful about this family and cult-like is that the effect that they all have on each other, it's powered by money, it's powered by social influence, it's powered also by the power dynamics of accepting toxic behavior from your family. And if you're one of the family members who's not going to accept the toxic behavior, you might be ostracized. Absolutely. So Casey Hammer, who would be Army's aunt, you know, when I found her book, she was working at Home Depot. And then you had the juxtaposition of her brother who inherited everything. And he, you know, was living in multiple homes, driving Rolls Royces and like living the high life, owning a school, funneling his money into various Christian organizations. So he really tied himself to, you know, a high level of like Christianity, evangelical type stuff, and used that as a smokescreen to kind of hide his bad behavior. Where does the throne begin, I guess, like with the Hammer family? It's with Army's grandfather, right? Yeah. So it begins with Armin Hammer. So he's the oil industrialist. So what happened with him was he was becoming a doctor. And his father was a doctor. They were from Russia. They were living in New York. He performed an abortion on a Russian czar's wife and she died. And instead of him going to jail, which would have been a much longer sentence as a medical student performing an illegal abortion, his father took the fall and went to Sing Sing for a few years and said that he was the one giving the abortion. So then young Armin Hammer took all the supplies from his father's medical practice and sold it to Russia. Then Lenin let him go into the Hermitage and pick a few paintings as payment. That started a very long history with Russia. Then what he did was he went and he married a wealthy woman and bought Occidental Petroleum. And the entire time while he was running Occidental Petroleum, he also had a mistress. And at one point, his wife found out about the mistress. And instead of, you know, either divorcing the wife and going with the mistress or breaking up with the mistress, he made her change her name and appearance and gave her a new role at the company and continued on the relationship with her. Who knows if this was the original seed, but as far as we know, that really planted the seed for a long, long history of power dynamics with women and treating women as objects. Yeah. yeah. And so much political stuff on the Russian side, in addition to the US side, because Actually, Armin Hammer partially funded Watergate and was pardoned by George Bush Sr. So you know how like sometimes you hear people talk about how their parents were divorced and that like affected them so deeply or like their dad cheated on their mom. And it's like this grandfather established a legacy in his family that he not only had a mistress and it was well known because he needed to have access to like other women but it was accepted by the family. It was known by everyone, but he also established a legacy of being involved in bad business and bad business practices. And so when you see it trickle down on his family, you really see how like that affected everyone. Armin Hammer was involved in so many different things. And one of the big things that the documentary covered was Piper Alpha, where I think it was 86 people lost their lives. Basically, it was an oil rig explosion, and it was definitely preventable. And so it was a huge PR crisis. So Armin Hammer flew out to England, met with Charles and Diana, and his basically right-hand man, who was writing books about him that he was approving and creating the narrative for that were not the actual reality of what was really going on. He was like, what should I do? He's like, act super sympathetic, act super remorseful. The day goes as planned and he looks super remorseful and sad and then he gets onto the plane and he's like caviar and champagne for everyone like that went great meanwhile like he had just been like pretending to be remorseful with charles and diana expressing regret over these lives lost it's truly a scene out of succession 
Absolutely. This and family. so this was the great grandfather. Then you get down to Army's grandfather, who was Julian Hammer. Julian Hammer. So this is also Casey Hammer's father. So she talks a lot about him in her book. And so essentially, Julian Hammer was the stain on his father, Armin Hammer's reputation. Um, and he actually had a paternity test done to see if Julian was really his son. But Julian knew that to get his father's attention, he had to behave badly. So he, you know, had a giant bowl of cocaine at the front of his house. Like it was just crazy. And he was known as the Hugh Hefner of Pacific Palisades. He had like this giant totem pole with red glowing eyes outside of his house. And there was just always all sorts of stuff going on. There was a story that the documentary didn't get, which was Casey was about nine years old. She gets a phone call, very strange phone call from her dad's ex-girlfriend. They go out to this Mexican restaurant to eat. They come back. They get into their garage and everything just looks disheveled. They go into the house. They go separate ways. Casey gets up to her bedroom door and she sees her stuffed animal and it's decapitated. And literally it's got lighter fluid on it. She looks up and there's somebody wearing a sheet like a ghost with lipstick smeared on their lips and a sombrero with a butcher's knife in their hand and starts chasing her through the home. Turns out her dad's ex-girlfriend and like five like methed out, like just on lots of drugs, people went into the house to ransack it and then held her dad hostage for hours. And she escaped to the neighbors. When police finally got a hold of the dad's girlfriend, she started to escape. And Casey actually like alerted the police and was like, she's getting away. And, you know, so I mean, I do remember what did make the documentary is like, this is just one of many stories of her childhood where she clearly had an abusive parent or an unfit parent who wasn't stable or present or able to nurture her in any way whatsoever. Can you explain why Julian, Army's grandfather, son of Armand, his great, great grandfather, can you explain why he was this stain on the family, why his father didn't love him as much as he should have? So instead of becoming like a business magnet like his father, he, you know, was getting super fucked up and going out in public like shit faced or, you know, doing all sorts of rich kid shit. So basically he was behaving badly, which could be a good thing for this family, but he was being too sloppy about it. Now that we've talked about Armand Hammer, the great grandfather, Julian Hammer, the grandfather, we're now talking about Michael Hammer, Army's dad. How did he deal with the family? When Julian divorced uh, Casey and Michael's mom, Michael was left with his father, Julian, Army Hammer's grandfather, <laughs> and Casey went with her mother. So Michael, you know, definitely dealt with Julian's antics and obviously him having these crazy drug fueled parties constantly. From what I understand, Michael became a bit of a partier himself in college, but then, you know, his, his father was obviously the weak link. Julian Hammer was the weak link. Armand Hammer had all the money. He was the industrialist. He was getting older. When Armand Hammer was getting close to passing away, obviously there were a lot of people in the family looking to get that bag, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So Julian Hammer obviously had a very bad issue with drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things. So he wasn't looking like a pretty good option for Armand Hammer to give the money to. Michael Hammer kind of cleaned up his act and he was really gunning for that money. So Casey Hammer went to Armin Hammer's bedside as he was kind of declining. And Armin said that, you know, she would get $250,000 a year through Occidental Petroleum and be on the payroll with all the benefits. She would be getting a lump sum inheritance that would probably be tied up in litigation over the, the trust. And then that there was money in Swiss accounts she would access and that the lawyer would liaise her accessing that money. So Armin Hammer passes away. And as he passes away, Casey's brother, Michael, Army's father, gets five moving trucks. And while Armin Hammer is still warm in his bed, just passed away, he starts loading up those trucks with things from Armin's house. Now, this is documented. Five of the trucks were there. One got away. Four were intercepted. But like one truck from that house could be like a fucking Picasso. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, who knows what was made away with, right? So anyway, Casey goes to the reading of the will. And she's anticipating that the will is going to reflect the conversation she had with her grandfather. But when the will is read, everything is left to her brother, Michael, and he lets out a sinister smile. And apparently years later, Michael said to Casey's mother that he was doing this to harm his father, Julian, and that Casey was collateral damage. So 
you know, it's one of those things where he really hated his father, I think, for what he went through. But I think he also really wanted the money that you know, was at stake and Casey just fell to the wayside and was left out of it. And again, women in this family are second class citizens. Women are not viewed as human in the same way. And that is also part of the reason why if you're a woman outside of the family, you're going to be treated as an object. Have you ever been on the hunt for a new doctor and you literally ask everyone you know for their recommendation, but it's incredibly stressful and difficult to find someone who can take your insurance and actually gets you and listens to you and makes you feel super comfortable? We've all been there. I recently was like, okay, it's time to get a pap smear. It has been three years and counting. It was really hard to find a doctor that I liked, but luckily I found ZocDoc.com. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. These doctors are all verified with reviews from actual real patients, not bots. And what's great is that you can find a fantastic doctor with amazing reviews and make an appointment within 24 hours because doctors on ZocDoc are often so, so very available. Go to ZocDoc.com slash cult and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash cult. ZocDoc.com slash cult. We want to tell you, culties, about this underwear that we're obsessed with. We can't keep this information to ourselves. It's just too good. It's the Fits Everybody Collection by Skims. I am truly so obsessed with this bra that I've been wearing. It is so comfortable. I wear it every day. The fact that I finally got around to trying it makes me really happy because it's so stretchy and soft and it just kind of like melts onto your body. You truly forget that you're even wearing it. Skims is creating the next generation of underwear for everybody personally too when it comes to bras my boobs sometimes fluctuate but I love how skims bras and bralettes are really comfortable and simple and accommodating for a streamlined look the fits everybody collection of underwear is super lightweight and molds to your body the buttery soft fabric stretches to twice the size without ever losing its shape meaning you get a perfect fit every time and it's available in sizes xxs to 4x believe the hype this collection has over 90,000 five-star reviews for a reason skims fits everybody and more best-selling essentials are available now at skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75, all at skims.com. After you place your order, be sure to let them know we sent you. Select podcasts in the survey and be sure to select our show in the drop down menu that follows. Are you sick of choosing between taking care of your skin and wearing makeup? I know I am. If you find most cosmetics ingredients make your skin worse or that most clean makeup just doesn't perform, you have to try Kosas. Kosas makes clean makeup for skincare freaks. Their complexion products are actually proven to make your skin better and are dermatologist tested, safe for sensitive and acne prone skin and hypoallergenic. Kosas Revealer Concealer is super creamy, weightless, and is a total multitasker. It's a concealer, eye cream, and spot treatment in one. Millions of people have tried Kosas, making it one of the best selling makeup collections at Sephora. Their popular, award-winning Revealer Concealer has over 1,000 five-star reviews. I personally tried the Revealer Concealer and I love it so much as well. I mean, it brightens, soothes, and pumps your skin. I know I can throw it on when I'm leaving the house so quickly and feel my best because I know I look better and less tired. So don't choose between wearing great makeup and taking care of your skin. Right now, Kosas is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more when you go to kosas.com slash cult. Go to KO osas.com slash cult for 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more plus free shipping. That's kosas.com slash cult. So let's continue now to talking about ARMY. How did ARMY then pass on the cultishness in this family and how did he make it his own such that we all know the story now? Well, here's the weirdest thing, right? Michael, Army's father, has this sex throne in Santa Barbara with the hammer insignia. It's like, so there's a chair, right? A giant seat with the hammer insignia on it. There's a cage underneath it. This is a seven foot tall sex throne chair. Jesus. And a hole in the seat. And honestly, like it horrifies me to even wonder what you do with such an object. And I, But there's a hook in the cage. Like it's a very, very weird thing to have, right? And it's a tough thing to talk about as well because there are 
kink communities, dominatrix communities that do have some, you know, pretty edgy looking props. And from what I understand, ARMY did hide behind, oh, this is just my kink. This is a fetish in order to get away with so much. And perhaps his father did the same thing. But consent is a huge part of kink and consent was not a huge part of their doings. So anyway, the yeah. sex throne. <laughs> the BDSM community like is super against what went down with all the situation because consent is a huge part and they don't want to be painted as like this non consensual thing so michael hammer had this like insane sex throne and we were asking how do you think army hammer came to be i assume by the influence of his own father well you wonder right okay your dad has a sex throne that's pretty specific but then you have all these graphic text messages like is there is it biological is there an attitude that is expressed towards women that nature versus nurture to, exactly like i don't i don't even know the answer to that i would think obviously this is just my opinion but i don't think that you can blame nature that much because there are a lot of people that grow up with toxic parents or influences and they don't go on to abuse others. And I think especially when you have the resources at your disposal to seek therapy and seek help, then for Army Hammer to be like, oh, my dad was abusive, so I was abusive. It's like therapy, my guy. <laughs> like <laughs> the, the Hammer family story really does inspire a fascinating conversation about nature and nurture. And I agree. I, you know, we can get into a whole conversation about free will if we want to. But I think that the amount of wealth that exists in that family is extremely corrosive and not natural for a human spirit. And especially when combined with patriarchy. And so if you grow up in an environment where you have all the caviar in the world and the most beautiful women in the world, what is there left to aspire to? Humans are naturally, you know, very very aspirational it's like what is there left there's human flesh question mark like. yeah and that's that's like that's their sex drive I mean an example of that with like other rich people is like why do they get a million cars because they already have had every other car in the world and so they're seeking that high from a new purchase and so it does in a non-okay way make weird backward sense that this man who has had every woman in the world would want a woman in a different way. You always just want what's next. It's like, there's no more foie gras left. What can I eat now? Yeah. <laughs> Whether I, or not he was actually eating people, it's a metaphor. <laughs> I, I mean, I was even seeing somebody post about the menu in Noma, you know, um, and you know, that, that movie, The Menu, just came out. And it's like, at a certain point, it's just like people are going to get small plates of really weird shit (laughs) and like talking. It was so oceanic. It's so funny that we always end up talking about capitalism in this podcast. Here I go. Strap in. But uh, (laughs) strap on. (laughs) I think, yeah, strap on, strap in, whatever your heart desires. But I think it's funny because it's this like self-feeding machine where the rich hold on to their money so that then they can buy more insane things and seek happiness in more insane ways. Whereas like if you just didn't keep all that money to yourself and you had less money, then you wouldn't be able to afford all of those things and you would find happiness in simpler things. Well, we I mean, there's all that research that shows that past a certain financial bracket, money will not bring you happiness. They say it's $120,000, but with inflation, I did the math. <laughs> I did the more. math recently. If I want to live alone, it's $200,000. <laughs> oh, Honestly, I, I mean, what I think is so fascinating about the timing of those Army Hammer like cannibalism allegations making headlines is that whether I, I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, but it really set off a year or two of cannibalism content in the media. We had that movie Fresh. We had the Yellow Jackets cannibalism plotline. We had the film Bones and All starring Army's former co-star Timmy Chalamet. <gasps> and I, Whoa. Is that I, weird? I totally didn't realize that it's like directed Timothy by the same Chalamet. guy, Luca Guadagnino. But all I want to say is like, 2022 seemed like a year to me when so many movies and TV shows that I was watching were either about cannibalism or had themes of eat the rich. So true. Right? Like The Menu and Glass Onion. And what that says to me is like we're in a cultural moment where we are starved for something. And that is being depicted in many ways. Either we're like eating the rich metaphorically or we're on the fringes of society eating actual people. Like we need nourishment right now. And that is part of why I think this Hammer story is resonating so deeply. 100%. And the other thing is, like, it's such a tangled web, Mm -hmm. you know? It's 
there's not one element of it that like it's like okay like this is the loop of like they were just messed up towards women it's something that keeps popping up for me as a theme is the power of a persona and the power of like a personality to have influence over people not just because of their connections and their finance but because of like the aura and their the charisma. mystique around them their charisma yeah and so so that's something you saw with Army Hammer's great grandfather. His grandfather was kind of like a druggy shithead, but then his father, Michael, restarted and reignited that charismatic leader vibe of like, I want the inheritance. I'm going to restart the company. I'm going to marry a Christian woman and I'm going to have the perfect son and he's going to be the next heir of the Hammer family. So it feels almost like Army Hammer had all this pressure on him to like become the next cult leader, cult leader of the family. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that, you know, I, I know somebody that met Michael Hammer out in Palm Springs and he was not happy that his son was an actor. He was not like excited about that. But one of the crazy things, it really one of the crazy veins of this family was that Michael Hammer decided to become an evangelical Christian because his wife was super religious and he, they really didn't grow up with that kind of religion, right? So nobody was supposed to be named Armand other than the oil industrialist, Armand Hammer. Army Hammer's name is Armand Hammer. So what happened was- he They was did named, that on purpose. They did. His name was like Alexander. And then the father of Army's mother, who was super evangelical, at the hospital after they named him Alexander, dropped to his knees and said that God spoke to him and his name was supposed to be Armand. So they renamed him Armand. There you go. When you have a direct line to God, you are claiming prophet status. That's cult leadership 101. You know what it really is too, is they were chameleons. Armand Hammer, if you said, I am Hindu, would be like, I'm, I'm Hindu too. So anywhere he went, he would change his religion based on the people he was around. If you were a wasp, he was a wasp. If you were Jewish, he was Jewish. This is a very, very underrated ingredient in the recipe of charisma. People think that charisma is just your ability to stand on a pulpit and magnetize people. But in part, charisma is actually your ability to make other people feel special and seen. 100% because he knew how to mirror people in order to make them feel at ease. And so essentially what ends up happening is at his funeral, there were all these famous rabbis there because he was going to get bar mitzvahed finally at the end of his life. Army Hammer's maternal grandfather, the super Christian guy who named him Army, gets up at the funeral in front of all these people and claims that Armand Hammer accepted Jesus on his deathbed. So it's just funny because there's all there's this weird vein of like cults coming into the cults, yes. if that makes sense. And a lot of Armin's money was funneled into Jews for Jesus and all these Christian organizations. But, you know, the great grandfather, Armand Hammer, he was asked by Casey, oh, why why wouldn't you become president, grandpa? And he said, because there's not enough power in it. So there's a combination of a huge thirst for power and then being the puppet master of everyone around you because if you don't follow the rules of this cult, you're getting cut off from the money, kid. <laughs> I'd love to know how Army Hammer rebranded the cultishness of the Hammer family and how that might have led to their exposure. Oh my gosh. Well, Army Hammer committed the cardinal sin of any wealthy family, which is, and I've heard people dispute this, but you know, the limelight is kind of frowned upon. Like I know some super yes. rich people that don't even put their fucking vacations on Instagram, right. you know? And so- I really always struggle with that. And I'm like, should I post a photo dump or not? And then I'm like, I paid a lot for this vacation. Everybody needs to see it. And that's because you're you're a future billionaire. Not because, <laughs> and by future billionaire, you mean current poor person. <laughs> and, you know, nobody is doing digging on a random industrialist that people have kind of forgotten about. But the second you attach some level of celebrity to it and the celebrity who is dating people like Rumor Willis and in a bunch of prominent movies that somehow flopped, people are going to start digging and people are going to start making the connection. And also, once you attach, honestly, any sort of slight scandal, that's going to pull the thread. So if he had just been a nice guy and just gone out on dates with girls and been normal and been a normal, nice guy, we might not have dug into him. But he's a hammer. He is. And he, he didn't fully hide it because his great grandfather has like a, a park in L.A. and he did do an interview there. So he didn't fully hide it. But at the same time, my friend was in an acting class with him for years and he was actually featured in the documentary. His name is Ryan Bailey. And Army had this really nice house and Army would act like he was couch surfing on a friend's couch, but it was his 
family's home. Well, Elon I don't vibes. even think the concern here is that he was hiding his wealth because, you know, even when people pretend to be poor, you can tell that they come from money. But I think something that was a red flag for me was when I found out he had been married for a really long time. Army Hammer has an ex-wife and two children. And that drew a very intense parallel to me to his great grandfather who had a wife and then he had a mistress and then what did his great grandson do he had a wife with kids and he had this perfect looking family but at the same time as soon as he got divorced he started getting into these very toxic like abusive relationships and it seems like it was probably happening all along Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there was a trail of people. There are people that haven't come out publicly. And, you know, I think obviously things were going on before, during, after. And now it's just like we've seen such a strange sort of progression from there where it's like he was cosplaying like a normal dude working at a timeshare place in Grand Cayman. We all saw that. And it's like, oh, really? There are paparazzi waiting outside your new little job as a timeshare person? Yeah. It also feels like the reason he was able to play this role so well of like this perfect man is because he is so conventionally attractive. I mean, as I was watching the documentary, the first episode, I was like, stop showing that angle of him. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I'm like, this man is good looking. And it's like, We are trained to trust good looking people. And so he was wealthy. He was good looking. He's well connected. And all of a sudden he also had fame. It's I see how it could be so easy for him. So I'd love to know about that thread being pulled that you were talking about. You were obviously part of the unraveling of this story. Can you talk a little bit about how the age old, generations old story of the cult of the Hammer family finally blew up in their face. So, I mean, obviously everything was buzzing around ARMY and these text messages with women and different things that were going on specifically with ARMY. But when the paper trail flew back to the great grandfather, it was really honestly Casey Hammer who bravely published that book. And then I found it seven years later when all this was happening and it put me at the center of, you know, a social media storm. And I was like, oh my God, I put out a 13 part TikTok series and I was like, what just happened? And, you know, the next thing you know, I have a Vanity Fair writer calling me. I have Good Morning America reaching out and it became this much bigger story. We've mentioned it already in this conversation and we've mentioned it several times on the podcast in the past, but we sometimes do talk about how certain power abusive families or toxic families themselves can mirror cults. What do you think about the Hammer family made it a cult for the people in the family, including people who were not destined to become the next leader like Casey? I think there were a number of factors. First of all, there were a set of very clear rules that if you did not follow, you were getting kicked out, but you were kept very beholden by the manipulation and the the money involved. Armin Hammer, the great grandfather, (laughs) learned Soviet espionage, like mind control tactics. And that was something that Casey had found out from a writer years later, and he was a master manipulator. So there was a lot of master manipulation going on. In addition, the people from within the situation were insulated to a point where until they really broke out, as adults, they didn't really realize what, what their experience was. It was so bizarre. Yeah, something that really stuck with me was, I mean, Casey's stories of her childhood. She thought that parties like that with like bowls of cocaine and people around all the time in robes and things like that was normal. <laughs> robes Until are she, not normal. Robes are <laughs> adults in robes naked underneath. Not normal. I can tell you that right now. But she thought it was normal until she broke out and fully went to go live with her mother. Yeah, I mean, Casey thought it was completely normal until really until she was an adult and I think, you know, got therapy and really like unpacked everything. So I think the people within thought that it was normal. And then obviously, you know, you have a set of these like patriarchal leaders throughout these generations that like, I mean, it's like, I don't know, Kim Jong-il and then Kim Jong-un, you know what I mean? Like, it's like it's passed down (laughs) between the men and they're all awful. So obviously the cult of the hammer family has severe impacts on the people who are in it they're terrified to leave they have lasting effects that follow them you know for years and years to come how do you think the cult of the hammer family affects the general public people on the outside i mean i think it opened up obviously the conversation at least with the people who were 
observing it, especially around consent in regards to the BDSM community. I think that was a big conversation. That was like a new conversation. I think like we've all had these conversations about wealthy families and about men who abuse their power and about people having, you know, good looks and, you know, being charming and deceiving people. But I think specifically the conversation around BDSM and consent was a really big one that I I saw burgeoning from all this. But I think like this story and many others that came out during the pandemic when we were all like more connected to our phones and computers and Reddit and Google than ever just looking for fodder for our minds. Like I think during that time, there was this really interesting web sleuth thing that was going on. And now like I even see it in the Bravo community with the Real Housewives. It's like everyone just has become an internet sleuth. And like everyone, if you decide you want to be in the limelight, Make sure that your side of the street is clean because people are going to start digging. I'm curious to know what you think are the cultiest aspects. Yeah, what do you think they are, though? Well, I mean, I truly think that the cultiest aspect is how on the surface, this looks like an aspirational family. This, until recently, has looked like a family of people that you would want to be like in the United States. But when you look under the hood, there are these mind-blowing, horrifying allegations of abuse that are directly connected to the things that make this family aspirational. Well, and think about this, okay? This family is an institution, right? Just like a cult. Yes. The Hammer family is an institution. They have foundations. They have the museum. They do all these charitable works. So from the outside looking in, you don't see anything wrong with it. Probably like people thought with the Sackler family, right? But ultimately, you know, Casey's grandfather the great grandfather of Army Hammer, Armand Hammer, wanted to win a Nobel Peace Prize. He wanted, that was his main goal was to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And he wanted, he, he would be quoted saying all this stuff about world peace, but it was all a facade. And, you know, Army Hammer's father, Michael, he was the evangelist. He was donating to all of these evangelical causes, Jews for Jesus, um, Oral Roberts University, all these different things, these religious causes. And that was the veneer on the outside. There was a completely different thing going on on the inside. And I actually uh, spoke with a woman that had dinner with Michael Hammer. And she was like, he was wearing skulls and crossbones and all these things. And she was pretty religious herself. And she's like, but then he was over the top about his religion at the dinner. And she's like, it was just this weird deception. Yeah. And that's really what it is. It's like, there's these causes and this religion and this art and these, these higher causes that are really just a smokescreen for bad behavior. Totally. So we've covered it all from the great grandfather to the grandfather, to the father, to (laughs) Even the Christian mother, you know, (laughs) Um, the father, the son, the Satan, the Holy Ghost, the unholy ghost. (laughs) This is like, I mean, we keep saying that like there's just so many aspects and you know so much about this family, but starting with the great grandfather and working our way down, what do you think is the cultiest aspect of the great grandfather? I think an insatiable desire for power is probably the cultiest aspect of Armand Hammer. His goal was to win a Nobel Peace Prize. He said to Casey Hammer that he didn't want to be the president because there was enough power in it. So I don't know what cult we would compare him to, but like the desire for power and the wielding of money to keep people in a structure of rules that he has deemed appropriate. And then if you don't play by his rules, you're going to be cut off. I mean, it's just the delusions of grandeur matched with the money to make a lot of those delusions possible. That's what makes the story pretty unique because most cult leaders don't have billions at their disposal. (laughs) Yeah, like maybe instead of billions of dollars, it's, you know, some imaginary entity that, you know, they've convinced their following. Spiritual currency. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Yeah, like it kind of reminds me of if you're comparing it to like a normal American family, the power that a father or a mother holds is being able to hold the annual like Thanksgiving dinner. And if you don't follow the (laughs) rules or you aren't the way that the family wants you to be, then maybe you're uninvited from Christmas or you're uninvited from Thanksgiving. But Armand Hammer, the great grandfather, he had so much power that you could be uninvited from America. Yeah, <laughs> literally. And, you know, America had to use him to get into Russia. Like this man was was playing, you know, chess and the rest of us are playing checkers. Um, <laughs> but he had them train his family, train like Pavlovian dogs because they would all line up before, you know, they would go to a Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> where they're serving dinner people. <laughs> God willing. Um, 
so if dinner was at 5 p.m., they'd all be outside smoking cigarettes in their car waiting for the clock to strike five. And then everyone wanted to be the first at the door. But you didn't come any earlier and you didn't come any later than five. The obedience. So he had everyone regimented like a cult leader almost. You yeah. Know? And that's scary because his influences go beyond the family and they go beyond money. Something that money can't buy is connections to presidents that will pardon you. I mean, he was literally connected to the royal family, U.S. presidents. He funded Watergate and then was pardoned by George Bush Sr. So how do you think that it makes a grandson feel when your grandfather gets pardoned by the president? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't know, but he also was able to pay a judge $50,000 and get his son exonerated from murdering someone. 50 grand? Yes. This was, I believe, in the 1950s. His son, Julian, killed somebody in the wee hours of the night. A friend of his, he shot him. And he got it written off as self-defense by paying $50,000. So this man literally had the power to have not only huge politicians, also like state politicians in his pockets to the point that they could literally get away with murder. We got to back up. I love how like a casual murderer is just one side plot point to the cult of the hammer tale. It really does remind me so much of the Kendall plot line from in Succession. Succession when which he, I can't believe you still haven't watched. I you know, have to it's watch nuts. It. Well, you have this story instead. So that's really <laughs> filling your quota. Can you describe the details of the murder a little bit just for some context. Yes, absolutely. So Armand Hammer, the great grandfather, his son, Julian. The fuck up. Yes, who had been Army's grandfather. He had a friend at the house and, you know, Casey Hammer and Michael Hammer's mother was still married to him. They got into a dispute in the early morning hours. He was like 26 years old and he shot his friend and killed him. Now, years later, Casey's mother did tell her it was definitely a cold-blooded murder, but his father had $50,000 delivered to a judge in LA and it was written off as self-defense. And this isn't like information that I'm like, he said, she said, like you can go on newspapers.com and you can find all the old newspaper articles about this. And it's just like, it's crazy, but it really happened, you know? Times were different back in the 1950s. You totally. Could- then you had Julian, Armie's grandfather, who, according to Armand, the great great grandfather, was not really living up to the Hammer family name. And yet that cultishness had to have been passed down. What do you think was cultiest about Julian? I think the cultiest thing about Julian was obviously that, you know, he fashioned himself as a Hugh Hefner of Pacific Palisades. And you have this house where it's like rules don't exist. You have a bowl of cocaine at the door. People are under the influence. There is money and it's all beholden to this higher cult leader, the great grandfather Armand. And Julian, it's just almost like this insane access to substances coupled with mental illness, coupled with trying to behave as badly as possible to get your father's attention leads to a lot of different things. In addition to murder, there were there were guns everywhere. Guns were being shot at these parties. It almost feels like Julian took everything that his father gave him and fucked it up. He used all his resources essentially just to party and abuse people in an emotional and sexual capacity. He didn't have the mastermind behind the tactics. He was just nilly willy abusing people. Which is, you know, also, I think, a more common way to be a cult leader. It's like Jim Jones was special. He was intelligent. He was widely read. He was a master code switcher in the way that Armand, the great grandfather, was a master chameleon and could appeal to just about anyone. But most cult leaders are these debaucherous opportunists, right? Maybe they have a little bit of charm, but mostly they're just these like Dionysian megalomaniacal humans. Hedonists who enjoy drinking and a little bit of LSD and sex, and they don't have a grand master plan from the beginning, but they will take any opportunity that comes their way. Well, you also have to remember with this slew of drugs and guns and all these different things going on, there was a Manson esque band of cracked out people who literally held this man hostage at one point, who broke into Julian's house and held him hostage and chased Casey around, you know, dressed like a ghost with a sombrero with a butcher's knife. There was a moment where, you know, a true indecent proposal happened where Julian offered his son Michael a million dollars for his girlfriend and then ended up dating the girlfriend for a while after a huge fight broke out. So you could probably 
analyze this man and come up with like 17 different cults based on different points of his life that he mirrored because towards the end of his life, he thought everyone was an alien because his mental illness had devolved to such a point, which we've seen with cult leaders time and time again, where yeah. there's mental illness driving the paranoia, driving the the rules of the cult. It almost feels like he had this cult-like influence, but he had it in the degree of his personal life. Like it was all within the bounds of his household. Like he just wanted power over people in a sexual and emotional capacity. And he didn't think big picture like his father had, that comes in with his son, Michael. Yeah. Let's analyze Michael's cult leader brand. (laughs) Oh my gosh. There are multiple brands of cults in this family, but I think with Michael, he married an incredibly religious evangelical woman and religion was really the smokescreen for everything going on underneath the surface. So it's almost like triple culty because he used a cult religion Christianity to cover his hammer cult. (laughs) Yeah. And I want you to imagine the most evangelical version of Christianity. And that is what he was a part of and siphoning the money that he got from his grandfather into. So from the outside looking in, it's like he has schools, he has foundations, he has the art gallery, but underneath it all, he had a fixer. He had a sex throne. He also had multiple sexual assault allegations against him. I guess what this cult is, is that every single person is presenting a veneer to the world that's a smokescreen and a fence, which behind this fence is criminal activity, abuse of women, a desire for power is probably a high level of narcissism. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of Nixium. I mean, like from the outside, it looks like it's this organization or in this case, this family that you want to be in that is going to help you that the resources it has are only positive. But when you look underneath the surface, like you said, women are being abused. Everyone is in a bad mental state and people only seek more power in a toxic way. But Nexium is a joke compared to the Hammer family. I mean, Nexium lasted less than one generation and the Hammers have been able to get away with so much because Nexium looks like a cult. You have that intuitive response when you see the sashes and the V-Week camp and everybody's like all happy dandy on a compound together. This on the surface doesn't look like a cult. And that's what makes it the biggest cult ever. And would you say like the mafia is a cult? Because yeah. I would say that it mirrors something Unless like that. After us. I don't want to be sleeping with the fishes, but like <laughs> it, it does truly mirror kind of the mafia. You have a bunch of different business dealings going on and different things like obviously the made you look scandal. So there is a desire to look like a business titan. Everyone's kind of, kind of trying to mirror Arm and Hammer, the great grandfather with that. Um, but the other thing is, and I forgot to mention this, Arm and Hammer branded everyone with his name because everyone's middle name is Armand and Army is the only one with the first name of Armand. Oh my God, that reminds me of so many socio-spiritual cults which assign monastic names or cult-specific names to their members as a way to fill them with a sense of elitism. You are special. You are different from everyone else. It's like in Heaven's Gate when the moment you joined, you received like a new name with a special suffix or or in the happy, healthy, holy organization, which is a kundalini yoga cult. Every woman has the same middle name. Every man has the same middle name as every other man. And everyone has the same last name. And that's doing real religious work or cult-like work to separate you from the rest of society. I think the biggest red flag for me of this cult is that you are literally born into it. So like when someone willingly joins a cult, they at least can have some people on the outside who are like, come back to us, we miss you. Whereas like, if you want to leave this cult, you have to ostracize yourself from your entire family, from your entire emotional support system, and from your entire financial support system. And your reality, everything you've ever known. And ultimately, you don't have a normal support system, but you're so entrenched in this that you don't realize it. Casey did not know her life was weird. So let's talk about Army Hammer next, because as you mentioned, every generation has a slightly different brand of cult leader vibe. You have like the socio-political leader magnate at the top, like business boss babe, which is Armand. <laughs> then you have the sort of debacle 
debaucherous hedonist, which is Julian, the kind of like David Berg type fuck up. Then you have Michael, who's like this religious zealot, at least on the outside with his evangelicalism. And then you have Army, the last horseman of the cult leader apocalypse celebrity. You know what the cultiest thing about Army was? And it's I mean, I think that probably every girl in this room has been with a toxic man. (laughs) There's a fucking playbook. And when you watch the documentary, he had a method to luring these women in and they all experienced very similar things throughout their relationship with him down to like the vacation he took them on down to like things he said to them down to the sort of death by a thousand paper cuts leading up to pushing the boundary, pushing the boundary, and then pushing it so far that you go from like zero to a hundred and you don't even really know how you got there. Yeah. And I think that's what happens to people when they go into cults is it's not like immediately they're like, this is a cult. Like of course not. they would yeah. run if they felt that way. At first yeah. they're like, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. This, yeah. this guy's amazing. It's a cult of one, a toxic relationship. Yeah. One of the most extreme versions. Love bombing. Of course. Oh my God. You have the whole thing. You have the love bomb. You have the groom. You have the coercive control. Can you talk a little bit about how fame and celebrity and social media contributed to Army Hammer's cult leaderishness and ultimately his downfall? I think that there's a level of narcissism that goes along with this. Some people wanting to be movie stars, not all. So I think that there is a level of, you know, going against the grain with that. But I think being in that world, being super attractive, having money and connections just kind of led and spiraled to like really, really bad out of control behavior where somebody had access to literally everything that they could have ever wanted. And then they felt entitled to whatever they wanted to take from the women they were engaging with. And nothing was enough. Right. And really non-consensual shit. So, uh, yeah, I think that having access to so many things obviously led to Army's cult leaderishness because obviously not only is he good looking, he's wealthy. He is a movie star. Of course, people are going to be drawn to him. So that was obviously in his favor. Um, But then social media led to his downfall because he, I think, was so cavalier because he was so used to things going right for him that he didn't think like, hmm. I don't even think it's used to things going right. I think it's the entitlement of never thinking he could get in trouble. I Mm -hmm. mean, his own grandfather murdered someone and got away with it. Mm -hmm. If your grandfather murders someone and gets away with it, of course you're going to DM someone, (laughs) I want to eat your flesh from a verified account. It's not like this was a secret kept from him. Like he knew that he would brag about it to women that he was dating which is a weird thing to brag about. But I I think you're right. I think it is a sense of entitlement and in a sense uh, that, you know, he was above the law. I mean, he had multiple generations confirming that for him. And then obviously, because he was so cavalier about his voice notes and his messages and not trying to do things completely privately, there was actual tangible evidence that these women were able to put out on the internet Thank God, because to be honest with you, I don't think people would believe them if there wasn't. Totally. Because it is actually so fucking crazy, the things that he said to them, that you would be like, there's no way somebody would say that. Something that's very much cult of the patriarchy to me is that even though there is all this evidence, he literally admitted to doing certain things. Isn't the case still ongoing? Yeah, as far as I know, it's still ongoing. And I mean, one other element that I think is interesting with the cult of the patriarchy is and the cult of Hollywood is... Robert Downey Jr. publicly took Army under his wing, allegedly paid for his very expensive, very fancy rehab. Like, I want to go to this rehab. Like, it looks like the fucking Four Seasons. You know, I mean, it's just the old boys club, right? Mm -hmm. All of it is the old boys club, which is a cult in in and of itself. Absolutely. I was going to say, it's like the Hammer family hates women in a very special way, but America hates women. Um, and if a man <laughs> you don't have to be is, rich to hate women in this no, country. not at all. <laughs> and it's just if a man is famous enough and rich enough and well-connected enough, he's always going to have an out. And you're always going to be able to rebrand yourself. I- I've said this so many times. Cancel culture only affects people without resources. There's a calculus that goes into whose careers get destroyed. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for you guys, though. So hearkening back to this like cancel culture conversation, do you think that Army Hammer will ever be on our screens again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he'll get an acting role again? Yes. And what's your prediction? I think it depends. If he's held accountable legally for his actions, I don't think he will get cast again. If he is not held accountable legally for his actions, I think in due time, he will be cast again. I mean, when you Google him, it's not the number one thing that pops up right now either. Mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, he has a hardcore cult following, the Call Me By Your Name stands, 
will go see him in something else. You know, he'll be subjected to the legal system, but he'll also be subjected to the court of public opinion and the jury's still out there. Okay, so Lauren, out of the three cult categories, what do you think the cult of the Hammer family is? A live your life? A watch your back? Or a get the fuck out level cult? I think maybe a get the fuck out level cult? You think? (laughs) (laughs) Damn. Uh, Murder, rape, abuse, power of money. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I feel like they're trying to rebrand, so. (laughs) As cult And by rebrand, you mean rebrand on another ass cheek because they are not, (laughs) they are not getting out of this one. Hell no. Yeah, I think get the fuck out is the only reasonable answer for this one. (laughs) And unfortunately for society to truly get the fuck out, I think Army Hammer needs to be held accountable, like legally. And he might even be the first generation in his family to ever do so. But we'll see. Does this mean that I can never watch The Social Network or Call Me By Your Name ever again? You can go on uh, 123movies.com and watch it illegally. <laughs> Pirate it. <laughs> Lauren, holy shit. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for so having much. me. If our listeners want to find you or follow you, where can they do that? So I am The Zen Blonde on TikTok and Instagram. And also, if you like the stories we told, Surviving My Birthright by Casey Hammer is a great book. And, you know, she survived the Hammer family. So got to got to give her a little plug. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back with a new cult next week. But in the meantime, stay culty, but but not not too culty. culty. Sounds Like a Cult was created, hosted, and produced by Issa Medina and Amanda Montel. Our theme music is by Casey Cole. This episode was edited and mixed by Jordan Moore of The Pod Cabin. To join our cult, follow us on Instagram at Sounds Like a Cult Pod. I'm on Instagram at Amanda underscore Montel, and feel free to check out my books, Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism, and Word Slut, A Feminist Guide to Taking Back the English Language. And I'm on Instagram at Issa Medina, I-S-A-A-M-E-D-I-N-A-A, where you can find tickets to my live stand-up comedy shows or tell me where to perform. We also have a Patreon, and we would appreciate your support there at patreon.com slash sounds like a cult. And if you like our show, feel free to give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And if you don't like our show, rate other podcasts the way you'd rate us. (laughs) 